Thank you for chipping in to another Cyberpunk 2077 lore discussion. This time we are doing a recap of the childhood heroes that you can potentially pick for Cyberpunk 2077. These are Morgan Blackhand, Saburo Arasaka, and Johnny Silverhand. Morgan Blackhand, rated as the number one solo professional in the business by the Solo of Fortune Annual 2020 Awards. He was widely considered to be one of the most dangerous individuals in Mike Pondsmith's cyberpunk universe. So, who is this mysterious Solo of Fortune? A war-worn veteran of the Second Central American Conflict, Morgan Blackhand, sometimes known as the Hammer, first became a Solo by accident, not design. Returning home in 2008 to the ruins of his native Brooklyn, he found himself protecting his next-door neighbour from an abusive and violent ex-husband. The incident ended with Morgan killing the homicidal maniac and earning a local rep on the streets as a protector of the weak. Morgan's good guy image lasted until a dust-down with a marauding booster gang leader, which brought him to the attention of a Militech recruiter. Morgan dealt with the booster with relative ease and thus was made an offer to join Militech. To Morgan's pragmatic mind, Working as a corporate solo wasn't much different than being in the army. The guys upstairs told you where to go and who to protect or shoot. By 2013, Blackhand was known throughout the Brotherhood of Solos as a professional, equal to the best Europe could offer. In time, Blackhand graduated from being a bodyguard and performing extraction work to tactic operations and strategic threat management. Although his abilities in these areas were exceptional, his reputation as a hard-nosed, no-nonsense boss, willing to do what is necessary and join his ops in the field, earned him an even wider reputation. Still, the Solo's Solo, with no hint of stopping now, Morgan is regarded as the number one in the business. The entire profession was improved by the release of the Enforcer's Handbook, with over 1 million copies audited to date, and something that may even be referenced in Cyberpunk 2077. It is obvious through Morgan may have taught many professionals all they know. It is not all that the Master knows. Morgan's handling of incidents like the attempted kidnapping of former Samurai Band member Kerry Uridine show the touch of the true Master. It is interesting to note that all five of the kidnappers were captured by Morgan and turned over to the Federal authorities. They were bruised, battered and beaten, but alive. Any Solo can kill, but only a master like Blackhand can eliminate a threat and embarrass the group's sponsors. Still, embarrassing a huge company like DMS can't make it any easier on your career. There is also Blackhand's Street Weapons Guide, the definitive book on weaponry in Cyberpunk 2020, but it offers no additional insights into the character. Morgan is known as a competent martial artist, having expertise in Aikido and Taekwondo. Even though he had some of the highest stats in the game, these were described only as estimates as no agency has been able to precisely quantify him. Mike Pondsmith has described Morgan Blackhand as a mixture of Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, and more recently suggested that John Wick would be a perfect analogue for the solo. Just for the record, that's John Wick from the first movie. He's honest to a fault, has a long memory, and never ever harms women and children, but he will make an exception for female solos. He's described as huge, swarthy, with graying hair and pale, cynical blue eyes. His voice is a whispery, gravelly rasp, menacing but sometimes friendly. His trademark look is all black, slacks, turtleneck, or a three-piece tactical suit including his trademark armoured trench coat. Pondsmith views Morgan Blackhand as his archetypical solo character. He's not alive because he's the best around, rather he is the best because he's alive. Seems simple enough. Even though Mike wrote the rules for Cyberpunk 2020, he doesn't have to bend them to play Morgan. He just plays him smarter, as though it was his own personal character, who he has nurtured for years and does not want to lose. In the Cyber Generation timeline, which for the record is a different chronology from the one Cyberpunk Red and Cyberpunk 2077 shall follow, Morgan decided he could use a vacation in Night City. He is described as a 52-year-old Solo, 
a stylish professional who's worked for dozens of corporations as a hired gun and enforcer. Well educated, he deliberately cultivates a rough, streetwise demeanour based on his tough childhood in New York. For many years, Morgan worked as a freelance solo, doing hits on assigned targets, extracting corporate personnel and leading black ops teams. In 2020, he resigned from Militech and began freelancing, taking only the jobs that interested him. His choices ranged from the profitable, such as his extraction of a multi-million dollar rocker, Alana Devon, from DMS to Fugitsu World Entertainment, to the quixotic, a many an out-of-luck victim threatened by a corporate ops team, booster gangs or street rats, suddenly found themselves with a large, very dangerous benefactor who saved their ass and then slipped silently into the night. To Morgan's worldview, it was only payback for the various black ops and assassinations he'd run over a long and checkered career. Then came the carbon plague and the advent of the incorporated states of America. At first, Morgan was suspicious of the ISIS grandiose plans for revitalizing America. He'd freelanced previously for some of those involved in ISA, so knew firsthand what sort of street rats they could be. Blackhand carefully began to plan a backdoor for himself, moving his considerable fortune in investments offshore to free Trinidad and other unaligned nations. On May 15th, 2027, CorpSec director Vincent Matthew approached Morgan to run the ISIS New Agent Corps, an elite cadre of CorpSec solos acting as the new government's internal security arm. Morgan's response, I don't take money to hunt down a bunch of kids, was typical, as with the ISIS retort, a pre donor assault on the Solo's Night City penthouse suite. The raid cost the ISA an entire five-man ops team. Morgan fell back to his safe house in Pacifica and waited. Two nights later, he eliminated a ten-man ops team and disappeared into the smog-choked wreckage strewn night. Ten days later, Morgan Blackhand walked into the Washington Bureau offices of CorpSec. Entering the offices of the director, he calmly killed Matthau, his second in command, and the eight-man security detail hastily dispatched to stop him. His point made, Blackhand left the building and escaped Washington before CorpSec could begin to mount any effective pursuit. By the time Alt Cunningham located Morgan to recruit him into the cyber revolution, he was safely established in his offshore Trinidad fortress, deep within a web of security remotes and fanatically loyal ex Militex solos who had followed their leader into retirement. Going back to the timeline relevant to Cyberpunk Red and Cyberpunk 2077, during the fourth corporate war between Arasaka and Militech, despite having many covert operatives in-house and Lazarus Group options, Militech came to the conclusion that their ties to the US government were so tight that the rest of the world might see Militech as a deniable extension of US policy. Militech therefore put together a covert operations team which would have a certain deniability of its own. They therefore coaxed Morgan Blackhand into the fray, who cost about the equivalent of three normal covert teams put together. And during this war, Morgan was described as the most famous living soldier of the 21st century, having completed hundreds of ops with flying colours. He got enough funding out of Militech to subcontract a group of highly skilled and motivated freelancers, making them answerable to him only. Blackhand's covert ops technique is to delegate duties to mission-compatible pairs. These mini-teams each complete their part of the mission individually, with communications depending on code words and burst transmissions. Blackhand works independently, adjoining mini-teams when he's needed most. Perhaps the most notable individual in Blackhand's Strike Omega team included Mike Eminem McRae, a medtech who was the field medic who amputated the shattered stump of Blackhand's right arm back in 2009. He went on to a medical studies when he returned to the States, but Blackhand never forgot him. When Militech needed a good combat medic 
who could hold his own in a covert situation, Blackhand tapped Eminem for the job. Militech also benefited from Morgan's network of connections, as alongside Alt Cunningham, they were able to convince Rash Bartmoss not to attack Militech and to assist them in finding Soul Killer. Morgan Blackhand's main rival was Adam Smasher, the combat cyborg. Adam saw Morgan as a threat to his metal is better than meat philosophy. Adam repeatedly tried to challenge him to a face-off, but Morgan simply ignored him. And naturally, this snubbing stoked the cyborg's psychopathic rage further. The two finally met during the final moments of the Fourth Corporate War. After successfully planting the nuclear demolition charge in the Arasaka Tower of Night City, Morgan Blackhand's Omega team began evacuating from the Arasaka Tower rooftop, only for Adam Smasher to confront him. While the building begins to shake from the detonation of the nuclear demolition charge, the two launch themselves at each other in a last, desperate attempt to kill their nemesis. The outcome of the duel was for many years unknown, although many initially thought this was the end of Morgan Blackhand. And Mike Pondsmith has now confirmed Morgan does indeed survive the encounter with Adam Smasher and will be coming back for Cyberpunk Red. Perhaps this means that Morgan Blackhand still has unfinished business to take care of in Night City. Arasaka are associated with ubiquitous black clad guards employed by many corporations, businesses, celebrities and powerful individuals. Although it is currently unknown if CD Projekt Red will depict Arasaka in the same manner. As a multinational corporation of enormous proportions, Arasaka has interests in a multitude of different fields including weapons production, consumer manufacturing and commercial banking. Arasaka's primary divisions are Security Arasaka was the most obvious force in the world of corporate and private security contracting. Corporate manpower security means having on-site forces capable of repulsing assaults, extraction and industrial sabotage attempts with quick response combat capability. Not all corporations or individuals in Night City have the power, money or inclination to assemble security forces of their own. The alternative is to contract these forces from a third party. Arasaka is not the only corporation offering this service, but had the best reputation for securing a corporation's proprietary interests. Arasaka Security covers five basic forms, the first being on-site corporate security forces. These are the paramilitary forces commonly seen on patrol in places such as Night City. Arasaka Security are considered to be well-trained and equipped to handle most combat situations. Clients can order all male or all female guards, or guards fluent in specific languages. All Arasaka guards are required to be conversant, although not fluent in English. Different levels of security force concealment can also be ordered, from completely discreet and invisible to ostentatiously threatening. If the security forces are visible, clients can choose to have them be unidentified or clearly identified as Arasaka personnel. Arasaka guards will sometimes wear the logo of a third party when subterfuge is required. Hopefully CD Projekt Red will adopt these nuances for Cyberpunk 2077. In most games, grunts basically look and sound identical, but Arasaka gives Cyberpunk 2077 a myriad of options in terms of physical appearance and accents. Arasaka also contracts out as paramilitary forces for one-shot operations, such as extractions. The board of directors at corporate headquarters in Tokyo have enacted policies ensuring that an Arasaka team never attacks an installation or corporation owned by Arasaka or protected by an Arasaka contract. Unless, of course, such actions are of benefit to Arasaka. Another type of protection that Arasaka Corporation provides is personal security in the form of bodyguards. The service is popular amongst celebrities, wealthy executives and the politicians of nations who no longer trust their respective secret service agencies. As with corporate guards, there are several options, including gender, dress style, race and nationality. 
It is considered very chic and a status symbol in Night City to have one good-looking full-time Arasaka bodyguard of the opposite gender on one's payroll. Arasaka Corporation also lease and sell their security equipment. This category includes lethal defense systems, advanced surveillance equipment and other quasi-legal items. Computer security is another product available from Arasaka Corporation. Proprietary Arasaka Intrusion Countermeasure Electronics, or iSystems, white and black, are also available for installation into clients' computer systems. Arasaka Corporation will train non-Arasaka personnel in the operations of all the security systems that it sells, but it is more typical for clients to buy a package that includes both the equipment and Arasaka trained people to run it. Police Services As a division of its security arm, Arasaka runs extensive police contracting services. Because of the dismal state of much state-sponsored law enforcement, Arasaka does a lucrative business operating and supplying local police forces around the world. Arasaka police, like all corporate police, are required to work within the limits of civil and federal law with regards to police procedures and ethics. Naturally, Arasaka are more likely to circumvent these standards for convenience than public police departments. Weapons Manufacturing Arasaka Corporation has three massive factory complexes near Tokyo, which produce weapons and equipment. For the most part, Arasaka produces all of the infantry weapons used by its troops and by its clients. They also manufacture a line of body armor. In terms of Arasaka troops, Saburo Arasaka remembers the last of the true samurai, charging into American guns or die trying, and insists that his men would also be samurai, or at least aspire to that level of dedication. Two special forces groups merit mention, the Ninja and ACPA Troopers. Saburo Arasaka still sponsors hereditary ninja and their training from birth makes them dangerous agents and saboteurs. They are taught the classic ways of stealth and sabotage. Most of the time their targets are not even aware that they have been targeted by ninja, for the stealthy ones do their business by subterfuge and infiltration whenever possible. ACPA Troopers are selected from the worthiest warriors and are trained for fearlessness and combat prowess. Their training and their hitting power makes them coveted battlefield troops. In many ways, they are the antithesis of the ninja, where the ninjas are proud to accomplish their missions without notice. The ACPA troopers think of themselves as the new Hatamoto, special troops of their lord Arasaka. Hatamoto is Japanese for samurai. Consumer manufacturing. Typical Arasaka products include space planes, transport, pharmaceuticals, clothing, computer games, pre-packaged meals and even office equipment. Banking Established by Saburo Arasaka in the 1960s, the Arasaka Bank provides the basis for much of Japan's economy and was responsible for its post-war prosperity in the 70s and 80s. The Arasaka Bank holds several prestigious accounts with many large corporations and is the core of innumerable investments and trust funds. Arasaka Bank was one of the first to invest in the net and cyberware, so they hold royalties on several patents, which continuously pay off. Many influential and wealthy politicians, private citizens, police departments and corporate executives are under Arasaka's control. Some willingly, some under duress. Several Arasaka and the board of directors in Tokyo have been using these puppets to further the Arasaka master plan of Japanese economic and military dominance. For example, in Japan, the constitutional clause prohibiting large-scale armament was trashed in 1996 by Arasaka-owned politicians. Within the corporation, only Saburo Arasaka, his sons and the hand-picked board of directors and a few select analysts, executives and operatives know the true extent of Arasaka's goals and influence. The highest priority for Arasaka employees is loyalty. Arasaka security agents will lay their lives on the line for the corporation first and the client second. Troops are required to demonstrate unquestioning obedience 
when they are dispatched on missions, although they must use initiative and intelligence on assignment or in action. Agents and executives who show signs of wavering loyalty or fail in their assignments are dismissed. Those who betray the company or cause a damage are eliminated. The Arasaka Corporation has many enemies in the corporate world, most notably Militech who competes with Arasaka in security hardware and weaponry. Another perpetual thorn for Arasaka is the Tyco Mass Driver on the Moon. In Cyberpunk 2020 lore, the Tyco Moon Colony dropped a rock onto Colorado Springs during the Orbital Wars of 2008, effectively annihilating it. The Arasaka Corporation are aware if they want to achieve world domination, they will eventually have to subjugate or destroy the mass driver. Many commentators joke that the Arasaka Corporation is both omnipotent and omnipresent, but there is a ring of truth that drains the humour from these witticisms. Arasaka has attempted to manipulate its corporate image, extolling the virtues of its security department, touting the philanthropic work of Arasaka Bank, and explaining how its manufacturing arm and subsidiaries form the backbone of an economically sound Japan. True as this might be, there are too many rumours and memories adrift in the public consciousness. Nor does the company's somewhat intimidating appearance do anything to endear it to the public. While Arasaka Corporation may be respected in Night City, there is an undercurrent of fear tempering attitudes towards Arasaka. Despite the nefariousness of Arasaka's covert goals, and often depicted as the bad guys for want of a better term, Arasaka are another mega corporation whom they may either do business with or be pitted against, depending on the choices they make in Cyberpunk 2077. Saburo Arasaka is the devious head of the Arasaka Corporation, which dominates most of the world, including Japan and America. Saburo has united factions of the Japanese government, the military, organized crime, and various smaller corporations under his control. Saburo Arasaka has become so powerful Many called the Cyberpunk 2020 era in Cyberpunk history the Arasaka Shogunate. Saber Arasaka's story began in 1942, where Lieutenant Arasaka, a 23 year old scion of a wealthy family and descended from a samurai lineage, was engaged in battle against the American Air Force near Rabul Island. Rabul Island is a reference to the Battle of Rabul fought on the island of New Britain in the Australian Territory of New Guinea during the Second World War. Saburo Arasaka was a respected pilot, with over 20 confirmed kills to his name. During a skirmish with American F4F Wildcat fighters, Saburo Arasaka momentarily passed through an enemy's line of fire, while making evasive maneuvers. Bullets smashed through the canopy of his plane, crippling his left arm and blinding his left eye. Despite critical injuries and encroaching upon unconsciousness, he managed to land his plane without crashing. Saburo Arasaka would later find himself hospitalized in Tokyo, being informed that he was now permanently blind in his left eye, and his left arm was useless. Mirroring actual events from World War II, on August 15, 1945, Emperor Hirohito of Japan broadcast an edict of surrender to Allied forces. As Saburo's dagger penetrated his abdominal muscles, he experienced a moment of epiphany. Saburo Arasaka foresaw a future where Japan would be dominant again, not militarily, but commercially. Saburo Arasaka began fervently studying politics, philosophy and economics that continued until his father's death in 1960. Now 41, Saburo Arasaka took over as head of the Arasaka Corporation, still a small organization establishing itself in international commerce. Saburo foresaw the dawn of the information age, and he knew that in order to achieve his goals, an information age weapon would be necessary. Saburo began fashioning the Arasaka Corporation into that weapon beginning with the creation of the Arasaka Security Division. This division specialized in high quality personnel, computer security and protection. Arasaka Security quickly developed a reputation as being one of the best in the world in its area of expertise, with its intrusion countermeasures being adopted by many of the corporations and governments. 
The opportune moment for Saburo Arasaka arrived in 1994, during the global market crash and shortly afterwards the collapse of the US economy in 1996. Saburo Arasaka had prognosticated financial turmoil on a global scale. He had already manipulated Arasaka's investments to ensure healthy profit from the demise of other corporations. The post-collapse world of corporate control led to widespread deregulation, which was exactly what Saburo Arasaka wanted. In 1997, Arasaka Security began establishing its own paramilitary forces, creating one of the world's first corporate armies. During the years 1997 to 2020, Saburo Arasaka continued to diversify and strengthen his investments, becoming one of the wealthiest men in the world. At the age of 101, Saburo was physically decrepit, but remains the genius he was in his younger years. Consequently, he has never relinquished his control over the Arasaka Corporation. Saburo was confined to a wheelchair after suffering a stroke in 2010. Doctors have informed him that his body can stand no further cybernetic or organic replacement, although the injuries to his left arm and eye have now been repaired. As a result, he seldom leaves the Arasaka family compound near Tokyo, and he never ventures outside of his beloved Japan. Saburo makes occasional trips to the Tokyo headquarters and to the research facility in the northern Honshu, but most of the time when he participates in board meetings, he does so via two-way holographic projection, or in a Braindance universe where he appears as a feudal Japanese lord. He intends to have his personality downloaded to an artificial intelligence at the moment of his death. The equipment for this stands ready 24 hours a day at the Arasaka Headquarters Infirmary in Tokyo. A special team is on call to transport Saburo Arasaka if he becomes ill or suffers any sort of trauma, similar to the Trauma Team International. In the Cyberpunk 2020 narrative, other notable figures in the Arasaka family and the Arasaka Corporation are Kei Arasaka, Hanako Arasaka and Yorinobu Arasaka. Heir apparent to the Arasaka Empire, Kei is Saburo's eldest son and most trusted confidant. Kei has been rigorously schooled and groomed to inherit the Arasaka Corporation. His expertise in matters of business, finance and investment is second only to his father's. Although Saburo Arasaka still makes the most critical decisions, Kei Arasaka, at age 40, is already official CEO of Arasaka, and he has many years of executive experience under his belt. Kei is not as driven as his father is, but he is calculating, cold and efficient. Kei Arasaka maintains a detachment he considers imperative to objective decision making. The only time Kei demonstrates any emotion is around his family and most trusted friends. While Saburo Arasaka is a virtual prisoner of the Arasaka compound, Kei often travels to Night City to consolidate business. Hanako Arasaka's impact on Arasaka's modus operandi and the Cyberpunk 2020 narrative was limited. Conceived when Saburo was 80, Hanako Arasaka is Saburo's youngest child. Saburo was charmed by his little daughter's stunning beauty and he decided to raise her in the sheltered confines of the Arasaka compound to protect her from the scarring traumas of life in the exterior world. Although she is an adult now, Hanako still only leaves the compound about once a month, and then only under heavy escort. Cut off from the outside world, she learned how to travel and explore the net instead. Saburo made sure that Hanako was never made aware of the darker side of the corporation, but through her net explorations, Hanako began to discover the truth. After Yorinobi graduated from the University of Tokyo, Saburo explained to his younger son the true nature of the Arasaka Corporation. Rather than agreeing with his father's vision, Yorinobu Arasaka was secretly appalled. That night, after a celebratory dinner given in his honour, Yorinobu slipped out of the Arasaka compound and vanished into the Tokyo night. Yorinobu has gathered around him a cadre of tough Tokyo nomads, the Kotetsu no Ryu, also known as the Steel Dragons. Together they have sworn to expose Arasaka. Yorinobu's knowledge of Arasaka facilities and corporate procedures gives the Steel Dragons some advantages, but they still lack the power or information to make serious headway against the corporation. Yorinobu is, however, 
able to navigate the world of the street and the corporate tower with equal facility. Sebra Arasaka is greatly saddened by his younger son's disloyalty and acknowledges that Yorinobu must be eliminated. At this moment in time, speculating on whether these characters will be present in Cyberpunk 2077 is somewhat of an analytical cul-de-sac. In the original Cyberpunk 2020 timeline, Johnny Silverhand and Morgan Blackhand were effectively killed after Arasaka Towers in Night City was demolished by a nuclear demolition charge, as detailed in his Cyberpunk 2020 Firestorm sourcebook. While Kei Arasaka successfully escaped from Night City, he was later captured by Spider Murphy. Spider Murphy forced Kei to do the honourable thing and perform seppuku, using the Soul Killer system. During the Shockwave campaign, Kei used Soul Killer on Yorinobu to trap his engram. Players are given the option of saving him, but his fate was never revealed. Interestingly, if one delves into Cyberpunk V3, which is a different continuation to Cyberpunk 2020, Sabro Arasaka is beheaded shortly after Arasaka are defeated in Night City. However, and now that Mike Pondsmith has revealed that Johnny Silverhand and Morgan Blackhand will return in Cyberpunk Red, and clearly Arasaka are present in the Night City of Cyberpunk 2077, this suggests the fourth corporate War will not be the last time characters such as Sabra Arasaka make their mark on the world of cyberpunk. Johnny Silverhand, the legendary rocker boy, epitome of cool and former lead singer of the Samurai. Johnny Silverhand is known in Night City as a famous and idealistic singer with his signature silver chrome cyber arm. The Samurai were a group of rebellious musicians whose music focuses around revolt and distaste for authority. As well as a highly successful solo career, his band The Samurai includes a fellow famous rocker boy, Kerry Uridine. Johnny Silverhand's discography includes notable hits such as Chippin' In and Never Fade Away, which are songs the player will hear while traversing Night City in Cyberpunk 2077. They offer a melodic reminder to the historic troubles that have plagued Night City. Other songs from his Cool Metal Fire album include Dancing With My Axe, The City and Flashing Lights. Johnny Silverhand rose to prominence in the Cyberpunk 2020 fanbase as the protagonist in the introductory scenario, Never Fade Away, that gave new players an opportunity to learn how to play Cyberpunk 2020. Covering events before Firestorm, Johnny Silverhand was involved in a deadly cat and mouse game with Arasaka. This story began in the Atlantis Bar, also the name of the bar CD Projekt Red set up at Gamescom 2018, and the player needs to to help Johnny Silverhand save Alt Cunningham. Alt Cunningham was a super wizard class netrunner and the person who developed Soul Killer. Soul Killer is a program that uses an advanced matrix recorder to copy the entire personality of an intruder, storing it in a huge database. It then wipes the original personality away, leaving a mindless husk that eventually dies. Arasaka wanted to acquire Soul Killer and so kidnapped Alt Cunningham, forcing her to develop a version for them. During the Never Fade Away scenario, the Soul Killer is used on Alt Cunningham, but Alt's digital ghost survives in the net. Johnny Silverhand's weapon of choice was the Melorian Arms 3516, which has been described as the most powerful personal handgun on the market. Eran Malor developed this radical new design to the personal specifications of Johnny Silverhand. Johnny Silverhand explained he wanted something that would drop a cyber psycho fan at 100 paces, no matter how much cyberware they had. Price was no object, and Eren delivered. Johnny Silverhand also has a drink named after him, called the Silverhand. The Silverhand is a shot of vodka mixed with brandy and a few drops of Chew 2 for added flavour. Chew 2 is a synthetic alcohol which also serves as a combustible superfuel in Cyberpunk 2077. It is fermented from a high sugar grain, Tricitium vulgaris mega suavis. Who are the rocker boys? To set the scene, imagine Johnny Silverhand gyrating at the edge of a stage, the hip hypnotic beat throbbing from the speaker stacks to either side of him. Driven by energy and fury, Silverhand bears his soul to the audience. Captivated by Johnny Silverhand's fire, the crowd's emotions become his personal plaything to be directed at will. His word 
delivered as lyrics thundering over the band becomes gospel for those caught in his spell. While a solo relies on guns, a rocker boy's armamentorium consists of their cool and charisma. Rocker boys such as Johnny Silverhand or Kerry Uridine challenge the authority of the social elite by inspiring and informing people. Music has historically been able to resonate with those wishing to express social and political dissent. On many occasions, music has galvanized rebellious youth to challenge the status quo. The most famous rocker boy band was The Samurai. The Samurai originally had five members, Johnny Silverhand and Kerry Uridine, who would later become well-known solo artists, as well as Nancy, Denny and Henry. The Samurai started as a backstreet bar band, playing various clubs in Night City such as the Palladium, Destiny and Nexus. One night at the Rainbow Cadenza, a wild-eyed person who looked like a dwarf addict, approached Johnny Silverhand and Kerry Uridine wanting to book their act. Naturally, the samurai thought this guy was so high on dwarfs that he was talking nonsense, until he gave Johnny Silverhand his card. The man was none other than Jack Masters, the head of Universal Music. Within three weeks, the samurai were signed to Universal, had a record in production, and were preparing to tour every major city in the world. It took the samurai only three weeks to achieve their first number one hit on the Euro Radio charts, with their single Blistering Love, followed by their debut album two weeks later. Despite their outstanding success, the Samurai disbanded due to an incident with their keyboardist Nancy. Nancy unfortunately fell in love with a dwarf addict who physically abused her and wanted her to quit the Samurai. Nancy, who had been a Booster Gang member prior to joining the Samurai, decided enough was enough. Following another incident, she threw her fiancé out of their 83rd story penthouse. While Nancy wished to rejoin the Samurai, her seven months in jail caused the Samurai to become apathetic and the members concluded it was time to part ways. Nancy changed her name to Bess Isis and began to work in the media. Henry stopped playing bass after an accident with a human interface prototype. A spike in the voltage jumped circuits and literally rewired his brain. Denny decided to form a new band called The Mastermind. A provocative Cyberpunk 2020 article titled Hitler Was a Rocker Boy added more substance to the Johnny Silverhand narrative. In every generation there have been charismatic leaders that have manipulated crowds by articulating a compelling vision and arousing strong emotions in others, such as Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi. One does not necessarily need to use a musical instrument as a vehicle to carry a message. Johnny Silverhand's influence was exemplified during the scenario Never Fade Away, where Johnny needs to rescue his ex-girlfriend Alt Cunningham from Arasaka Tower. Unable to penetrate Arasaka's security by themselves, Johnny Silverhand creates a diversion by announcing a concert just outside Arasaka Tower. 6,000 ardent samurai fans turned up to the party. The Arasaka guards began to lose their nerve and one of them accidentally fired into the crowd. Furious pandemonium ensued as the samurai fans retaliated en masse, listening to Johnny Silverhand's chipping in music. While the Johnny Silverhand and samurai narrative appears to be quixotic, it would be fallacious to believe there were no negatives to Johnny Silverhand's lifestyle as evidenced by the rapacious treatment of music talent in Night City. Music stars are a lucrative business and corporations always want a piece of the action. For instance, an attempt was made by EBS record executives to blackmail Johnny Silverhand. Hoping to force Johnny Silverhand into signing a solo contract with EBS, the media corp threatened to reveal that the singer was in reality an AWOL US Marine who had deserted during the second Nicaraguan conflict. Johnny Silverhand outmaneuvered EBS by going public with his now famous Sins of Your of that album, which revealed his secret and brought to light the plight of veterans of that covert war. Not only was the EBS threat blunted, but the album triggered a wave of sentiment that resulted in the National Amnesty Program for AWOL Central American Conflict Veterans. As Johnny Silver had himself remarked, if you face the truth, you can face anything. So, 
I faced the truth. In the Cyberpunk 2020 narrative, an alternate version of Johnny Silverhand also exists. This version of Johnny Silverhand was possibly born as Robert John Linder sometime in the 1980s, the son of an Apple computer programmer and studio guitarist working the San Francisco club scene. Linder's family is rumoured to have been killed during the collapse. Records appear to indicate Robert joined the US Army in 2004, training as a Cybergrunt soldier in the Special Operations Branch. Now, it is assumed, thanks to Johnny Silverhand's participation in the Amnesty of 2009, that Linda either went AWOL from Nicaragua or was assumed missing in action early on in the war. But it is equally possible that the man known as Johnny Silverhand only assumed the identity and dog tags of Robert John Linder. He could have been someone else all along. Taking on the appellation of Johnny Silverhand after the trademark chrome cyberarm he adopted in 2005, Linder embarked on a successful career as a rocker boy. With his band The Samurai, he penned legendary tracks such as Chippin' In, Metal Soul, and Never Fade Away. In 2019, lightning struck Johnny Silverhand in the form of a botched Biotechnica-sponsored assassination. Biotechnica was responsible for producing Chew 2, amongst other things. What is commonly believed is that Johnny Silverhand emerged from hiding nearly a year later to release Clone Wars, a highly political concept album detailing the abuses and dangers of human genetic tampering. Where the Johnny Silverhand narrative diverges from the main timeline is that the assassination was partly successful. Johnny Silverhand's body was torn in half by an improvised explosive device that ripped his AV-7 apart. Johnny Silverhand lay near death in a cryogenic tank for nearly a month before his location was found by the ghost of Al Cunningham. As mentioned previously, Arasaka had used the soul killer on Alt Cunningham, meaning Alt's ghost now wandered the net. In this timeline, Alt had cloned herself a new body, the Alt to Cunningham. Alt offered to upload Johnny's ghost to the net, then download him into a new cloned body. Johnny Silverhand agreed. Eight months later, Johnny Silverhand appeared at a press conference to release the delayed Clone Wars album. As Johnny Silverhand knew he had been put into a cloned body, in many respects this gave special poignancy to his work. However, this second version of Johnny Silverhand was a subtly changed man. Having stared death in the face and lived to tell the tale, he became more political. Johnny Silverhand's next four albums, Ring of Fire in 2021, Surrendered Gold in 2022, Media Gods in 2023, and Street Armageddon in 2024, covered the gamut of the political spectrum. In this timeline, rather than being killed when attempting to save Alt Cunningham from Arasaka, in 2026, Johnny Silverhand began working on a new album. Tomorrow's Child, which aimed to expose the government for its inhumane treatment of children infected by carbon death plague. In retaliation, the American government had Johnny Silverhand assassinated. Once again, Alt Cunningham steps in and creates a clone from the frozen tissues and ghosts of the original Johnny Silverhand. Unfortunately, as it was the original Johnny Silverhand, he had a seven year memory gap. Alt this time told Johnny Silverhand the truth, that he was a third generation copy, and if he so wishes, was practically immortal. This Johnny Silverhand called himself Mr. John Silverhand. Hey Chumba, I'm Kazaliski, and I hope you found this Cyberpunk 2077 lore recap to be informative. Are you interested in more Cyberpunk 2077 content? then be sure to hit that subscribe button. If you have any questions or feedback, please let me know in the comment section. Thank you for chipping in.